Buried and ignored. Neglected for more than 65 years. That's how the history of the ethnic German cleansing has been dealt with. The survivors' stories will pay homage to the 15 million people who felt it, lived it, and the many who died from it. The forgotten genocide will now be remembered. I'm surprised about the project um, because when I went to school in Germany, we rarely spoke about this. Survivors encircle the globe. Of the fleeing survivors who came to the United States, a large number settled in St. Louis. I came to St. Louis uh, roughly about 60 years ago after being expelled out of my former home in Yugoslavia. But this is as far as the Danube Swabians uh, have settled. The ethnic Germans who lived in the mountainous borders of Bohemia and Moravia Silesia, a region near the Sudeten Mountains, settled there more than 700 years ago, when in the 13th century, King Odokar II, along with other sovereigns, promoted German settlements in Bohemia and Moravia to develop the mountainous frontier regions. The ethnic Germans of Hungary, Romania, and Yugoslavia were known as Danube Schwabian. The term Danube Schwabian was coined by Robert Seeger in 1922, in contrast to the Schwabians in the southern region of Germany. By invitation of Kaiser Karl VI, the first large trek came down the Danube River, beginning in Ulm, Germany, to the Habsburg Crown lands of Hungary, to rebuild the population after the 150-year Turkish occupation. There would be two more invitations to the German people. Empress Maria Theresia invited the second trek, urging more people to migrate down the Danube. Her son, Emperor Franz Joseph, would extend the third invitation in 1783, when a compromise was made to unite two major Habsburg realms together, forming Austro-Hungary. And from there, they went on to some flat boats down the river on the Danube, until they came into the area, the Pannonia Flats, which uh, was the area where they settled. The excitement of a new beginning came face to face with adversity. All kinds of waterborne diseases decimated the, the population, but within three generations, they have created a, a very prosperous uh, area. I think the original uh, number that was uh, given was something like 15,000, but over the years more and more came and settled in that area. A nice dog, uh, and that really rips you out from sort of, it was sort of a really like almost a paradise uh, for us kids there. But there are always those kind of people who are bloodthirsty, and uh, in the German army you had very similar ones. So when all the devastation that was caused on Russia was then repaid in kind, except in Yugoslavia, the main perpetrators of the revenge were the guerrilla forces of Tito's. Tito was a Croatian communist. In 1938, Czech President Edvard Benesch inducted a policy to expel the German minority to be executed with utmost brutality. By the time the Pusterum Conference took place, one million Sudeten Germans had lost their lives to wild expulsions. Homes were built and villages grew through the many trades and businesses the ethnic Germans established. One of these villagers was Adam Martini who was born to a woodworking family. It was uh, late, late in 44, I think it was late summer, uh, when the partisans uh, would come into the, our town and start trouble. So the town decided they're going to all move to Germany. I, of course, was only seven years old or so at the time, and uh, I remember that we had to leave the dog back, and the dog actually cried, I thought, you know. So we got this one very spirited horse, which was never used, you know, they always used it for parades and things, but was not used for 
pulling a wagon. So my grandmother, my sister, my mother and I, we were in this wagon with a big colony of car wagons. The Martini story is commonly heard regarding the expulsion. Some fled, others were imprisoned. As a young girl, Anna remembers how life was for her. In the spring, and took us all out of the houses, the, mostly out of the big former houses. We were lucky we could stay because my mother used to cook for some soldiers, uh, Russian soldier. They said, when something comes, we should go as far as we can, as far as our lake takes us. He should leave from there because it's not going to be pretty. So told us the same thing. Then you have to go, go. Don't stay back because they start to kill you. They did middle of the night. The partisaner, which was there, they start shooting people. Whoever came out of the house, they shot. Just shot you right there and then. After grammar school, my parents sent me to Grosbetsch Correct to high school. And I spent two years there, but the second year I couldn't complete because my mom came and took me home because everything became so chaotic at home and she was afraid for my life. And in 1944, in the fall, the um, gypsies of a town started coming in our homes and taking whatever they pleased to have. After that, Tito's partisans came in, and they came to our homes and did the same thing. Russian soldiers came into villages ready to terrorize. Uh, my ancestry was there since uh, 1668. We heard some commotion on our street. The door opened, and there was a gypsy woman and a, a Russian soldier and a partisan. Right, they came into the house, they put a gun on our heads and said, well, out, out you go. They collected all the people from our road in front of us and uh, we had a Serbian neighbor who came in and robbed our house right in front of us. And we were neighbors for 25 years. It was on a Sunday morning. My mother went to the 8 o'clock church services, but she came home soon all excited and crying telling us that shortly after the services started, a soldier of Marshal Tito came in and walked up to the priest. A few words were exchanged. The priest told the people to go home, be ready in two hours. Uh, Russians and the partisan preferably came in and uh, in one day they collected all the major people in our town who were leading citizens, about uh, 68 of them, they collected them beat them up severely and they killed them. Serbians, the partisans, rounded up whoever, uh, anybody that was a little rich or somehow or other was maybe political. Uh, my mother was saying, well, we're not going uh, with the rest of the group because the father was in, in the army and it was just my mother, my brother and myself. And we said we're gonna. She said we're gonna stay. Well, then they uh, threw us out. They came with the guns and says ten minutes is all you have. So she bundled up whatever she thought, and we had to get out of there. I remember a big colony uh, going off to one of the camps. We went Yarek, Krushivil, and and Kakova. We were those free camps. Uh, it, I was nine years old. It was. Um, summer of 1944, that was the beginning of the camp. Family members were taken away, leaving spouses, parents, and children horrified. My dad was in the army, he was called into the German army in 1942. But I didn't see my dad anymore, neither did my mom, because we did not even know if he was alive. Never having stood on German soil did not matter to Hitler. If a man's nationality was German, he fought for Germany. My father was forced to join the military service in fall of 1944. The Nazi party considered the Danube Swabians gypsies or lowlives, an embarrassment to the German heritage. So the Nazis often sent them to the front. 
my father was always hiding in the, uh, where was he hiding that he doesn't have to go to the army? He was hiding under pigs, on top of the pigs, things they had, a little stool, that's where he was hiding middle of the day. And at night he came out because nobody seen you. And then one time they found out that he was hiding there and he had to go to the army. They came with the guns, they took him and he had to leave. He had no choice. I mean, either leave or go with them or they kill you right then. My uncle hid in the pig's manure for six months. Daytime, they covered, he covered himself till here and he was hiding in the pig's manures and the cow manure which we had in the back, hiding in there then, because he didn't want to go in the army. They got him too. They uh, went through the houses. Uh, they were firing machine guns uh, around us and uh, we just simply hid in the vineyards in the back of the house. And when they came to our house, they took possession Stalin used the word retribution to justify his demands for slave labor. Russia requested from Tito was that he sent X number of people to Russia to, to work in, in the coal mines, in other uh, uh, farms and wherever. People too old or too young were left behind. They took our people uh, to do um, work and they took them toward the front and actually they had to dig fortifications and foxholes for the Russians. They, the Serbians came and collected all the people which were left in town. The Russians uh, made a temporary airport not too far from my house. There was a big uh, grassy area, acres and acres. And uh, one morning they came, everybody has to come with a shovel or a rake and a report over there. Anybody from 8 or 10 years old to 70. Strong, healthy men and women had to fill the quotas of Stalin. The soldier took us to the train station. 55 train wagons were ready for us, for 40 people in one. Bag. And, and they took all the young people from 17 to 35 men and women and took them away and they put them into a Russian labor camp. They took the men and women to Russia, any men that were there age 16 to 50, they were home for whatever reason and women also from, by us from 16 to 30. Our, our people are uh, in their prime, primarily those from age 18 to 35, and the women from age 18 to 30. And uh, the day after, they marched them to Apatin from where they were deported to Russia. Desperation humbled people to turn to anyone to keep their disappearing family together. After they took me away, they, all the women were marched into the airplane hangars, which were at the edge of town, that were surrounded with barbed wire. So this motorbike comes roaring into the airplane hangar and this uh, soldier jumped off the motorbike and he pointed the gun and he said, march out. He marched her all the way to almost to our house and he said, now you run home, don't you turn around. And so she ran home, she got to the house. My two grandmothers were there, her mother and my uh, father's mother. And there they explained what happened. My grandmother went to the man, to that house, and begged her on her knees to please not take her, her daughter-in-law because they had taken my father already. And she, she was a woman in her 50s. What was she going to do with two little kids? Uh, I was four at the time. My brother was uh, 10 or 9. And so, okay. He said, all right, you go home, I'll take care of it. Pulling families apart was not the only strategy used. Constant relocation lent to the prisoners complete unrest. And they came and they said everybody that went to higher schools 
come out of the robe. My mom held on to me because I was away in school already. And she says, no, we, we stay together. I'm not going to let you go. I only have you. You stay with me. Okay, I stayed with my mom. The rest of the girls, they were shipped down to Sibling, uh, Belgrade, and there wasn't one girl that made it. Uh, Christmas of that year, 1944, they allowed everybody to come home. Now, this was for us one of the most joyous uh, event because at that time we thought the Russians are gone, uh, our people come home, and then we would uh, go on and live in peace. When the Russians entered, suddenly horror stories popped up that Russians had massacred whole villages, but from the stories of my mom, which were told by my stepdad to her, I knew that she was raped several times and that she was in fear for her life all the time. Tito promised all those loyals to him that they would uh, be uh, given the houses of the Germans. Gypsies came in the schoolhouse and whatever we had, what we were able to carry in a hurry, we had to put in the middle and or something they liked, they helped themselves. They gathered some horses, some of the elderly were put on, we had to walk to adjacent town, it was called Mamarak. I fled our town and I continued my high school years in Vienna. A stepdad came from East Prussia and he fled all the way over 1,000 kilometers. As a little child, he was five years old, walking the distance all the way to the west. We got up there just about before Christmas, uh, maybe uh, three, four weeks before, with a lot of problems. So the horses were not used to stop on a hill and hold the wagon, so they would, they would keep up with the Ours would go on back. So I had the job of putting a piece of wood behind on the wheel there, and. And of course, when the planes would come in, and sometimes they were friendly and sometimes they weren't. So we, we were told to jump into the ditches. But somebody had to stay by the horse because the horse is, was always spirited, you know. So we decided grandmother is the oldest. And, if, and she, she didn't know what was going on anyway. So grandmother had to hold the horse. And we all dived into these things. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, when I, I think back, it's, there were a lot of funny parts to this uh, survival thing, you know. I'm decided that we're going to evacuate. First of all, because of the Russian front coming in, and second of all, being a battlefield in our area. A cousin of hers, a woman all by herself, she offered to give us a ride. As we approached, approached the Danube River, there was more and more military crossing the Danube River, and so the civilians were not allowed. Like I said, there was no bridge. You had to be ferried back and forth. And this woman, not having any children, just didn't care for having three boys in that covered wagon. And she dumped our belongings under the street, and there we were. And uh, the tragedy really began there. It was a hot day, dusty. We had not no food and uh, nothing to drink except some of the food that we took along, but we were not allowed to stop. Some of the people that uh, start lagging behind, you know, some of them were beaten uh, as we went along. A man in front of me collapsed and died. In the ditch, a woman gave birth to a child. It was uh, very, very sad to see that uh, they, they did beat up old people. We were rounded up, we got there, and then they said, Go back and get all of your money. We want all of your money. Most of us were put on wagons, or some of us, and we went to the next town, which is only about a mile and a half away. The people of Yark fled, followed by hordes of prisoners, young and old, being marched into their place of death. There we were separated like uh, cattle. The kids and the old people who could not work anymore then were taken by wagons to the, how she said, the most memorable of my camps, which I remember, which was called Yarek. A month after 
the Russians came. The Russians really didn't bother us too much. Then the partisans took over. They told us just take uh, uh, something to eat for a day and uh, we're gonna go somewhere. They didn't tell us where. And uh, some old people couldn't, couldn't, just couldn't walk. They stayed behind, they just, they beat them with the, with the gun, you know, with the bat. And they stayed behind, they shot them right there, underground. Whoever stayed behind, they didn't shot them right away. But maybe a few hundred feet, they just couldn't go. They fall, they crawl on all four. They beat them and shot them. We walked for two days and two nights. There was a few they put, they confiscated the horse and wagon, whatever, and they put the people on there. And they brought us to Yarek. Then the wagon broke down with the horses and they caught us. They put us in a concentration camp by Dachau. And they said, well, the Russians are coming west. And by Monday, at 9 o'clock, we got to be over that bridge to that next town, bigger town, which had a train. Because at 9 o'clock, they, they're going to uh, blow all the bridges up. You just grab what you had, and we ran. We made it across, but just in time, you know, and we made it to the, to the station. But eventually we landed in Austria. I remember a big colony uh, going off to one of the camps. We went to Yarek, Krushivl, and, and Kakowa. Churchill was alleged to have said in August of 1945 in the House of Commons that a tragedy of immense proportions is playing out behind the Iron Curtain. They could never stop moving, running, hiding, and being forced out of every place they tried to rest. They bombed Munich, bed. And then my mother said, now it's time, she says. There were so many <coughs> Yugoslav Germans from Yugoslavia, because you know we were forced onto the Austrian people. They didn't like us either. They decided to make a big train out of it, like a freedom train, and we go back and my father, coming out of the military, says, I don't like it here. And my grandmother was smarter on this one. She never wanted to go back. She says, it's no good down here. Well, the train was full, people singing, drinking, you know, we are going back home, you know. The best thing for everybody is to get back home and reunite the family. We landed up on a, a big uh, uh, train station. And we were lucky. We didn't know where that train was take us took us to Austria. He put us in a railroad car, and I remember all these big adults around me, and it was a cattle car with the door open. We went through a village named Kakowa, but we had to keep going to the next village named Krushivl. We, got, we went all the way up to Zagreb. The train stopped there, and a big voice came on and says, leave everything you have on the train, and go into the train station. The first train station we get into, we get surrounded by partisans. One of the soldiers came and took my mom off the train. They expected the worst. Then we saw people getting off train, the train where we lived across the street, or they walked right into town with bundles on their back. After a while, both of them came back. He told her, do not go back to your hometown, because all the Germans are in concentration camp of Gakowa. But well, next thing you know, they locked all the doors, ding, 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 everywhere. And we knew by then that uh, we are not going home. People who were not able to keep walking were shot to death and left on the roadside. A decision was made by the Big Three, Great Britain, United States, and Soviet Union at the Allied Conference in Putstrom, stating that the ethnic Germans would be eliminated from Eastern Europe. In 1946, the American war correspondent Robert Murphy said, Knowledge that the expellees are victims of a bad political decision carried out with the utmost ruthlessness and disregard for the humanities 
does not cushion the effect. The work never ended. Long, hard days chained together with nothing but starvation and pain. A few of us had to take the furniture into another house. All furniture went into that house. Then they took the linens and everything, or your shoes and your clothing, whatever you had was then put into another house. We had to take everything apart and if you stepped in your, I was in my own house, my parents' house. If you stepped onto something that you wanted to save, like take pictures, you were hit to no end. In other words, no pencils, no papers. There was nothing that you were able to take on your body. As farmers or people who needed help used to come into the camp and they bought you like a, a slave. That was it. So my mother became a maid for one Serbian farmer. And I was, uh, how should I say, I had to take care of about 20 sheep, 30 pigs, and a couple of cows. Outgrew your own shoes. There was nothing available, so you had to put rags around. I had to run across a wheat field without shoes to chase the sheep, you know. They had 3,000 water, but it was a pond. And we have to bring out all the dirt. Two and two have to go with the car that trash out from pumping. Then they built it up, the, the, the fabric. And we, we have to go sometimes outside and bring the, the, the material in with the lorries, with wagon it. A big stone, stone, you know, and they make that to sand. In the, in the fabric. Everything was hard. We have to, to yeah. dig them out and put it on the, on the bag. It was immense work. We have no free day. A Sunday, they, they don't know what is a Sunday. When, you, when, you was, uh, when I was weak I, and I couldn't do the work anymore, they put me on a gardener eye. You only was sick when you have uh, a fever. The women had to were marched out uh, into the courtyard. Somebody stood in front of them, and then Serbian would scream out the stuff. And when he was done, they all had to take their right fist and pound the air and scream three times, Živio Tito, which means long live Tito. My mother was a slave like the rest of the women. Britain's Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan commented to the Times Magazine of November 5, 1945, Great God, it's the height of human madness. It is a dreadful spectacle. They took most of the people to Fruchivu, which was about three miles from Gakuma, and that was then a camp for them. Uh, we were lucky, my mother and my sister and I were lucky to be chosen to go to the doctor's house and take care of the people that had been sick and could not be moved. The work crew, which was involved in horses, for about two, three weeks I was the um, water boy. I was bringing water to people. Wherever they were placed became their home, their bed a floor, their future grim. Stalin stated during the 11th plenary session at Postrum on July 31, 1945, the point is not to simply take the Germans and drive them out of the country, but the Germans being put in a situation that it is most undesirable for them to live there. When evening came, they did not let, did not let us go home. They put us in the houses next to the town hall. Because my father had a tavern and he had a lot of wine in the cellar, barrels of wine, the commandant decided that this was going to be the house he was going to have his place. And they put straw on the floor and the people had to lay side by side in each room as many as could fit. We were put into two blocks of busboard. Boys separate from girls. On April 1st, we were 
loaded on, on trains, and from there it went to Gakawa. Because of, uh, there was no substance in the food, uh, most of them did get uh, diarrhea. The people, if they had to go, they just had to run in the back. There was a whole duck with the, the beam on there. We call them the thunder beam. The owner of the house, she ran back there. And uh, by the time she got there, she soiled herself. Uh, there were 4,000 of us put in this airplane hangar. And at nighttime, uh, we would fall asleep. And the mist from our breathing would rise. And in the morning, it would cool down. This was in April, and it would start raining on us, literally, because we had no soap. It was very hard. There was one big room that was like 30 by 30 with three wash tubs for 4,000 people to wash their clothes and no soap. Our toilet facility was a ditch a yard wide and 30 feet deep that out in the open, nature called, there you were. <laughs> every night we would pray, and every night we would pray for the living. The words always were, and God bless Daddy, watch out for him. That day. And one day, I said to my mother, and it was dark, everything was quiet, we were just praying, I said to her, who's Daddy? And my mother grew very silent, but I knew I said something wrong. And then she said, Don't you remember your father? For many prisoners, a barn became home. The, the bridge. And no heating, no heating, no, no, uh, that was uh, off the cold. And that night we slept between horses. I mean, we didn't have anywhere to sleep, so the soldiers told us to go in the stables. Well, the horses didn't step on us or nothing. Our sleeping quarters, there was a house and you had a bedroom and sometimes like a regular bedroom, but there were up to 18, 20 people in there and you had straw on the floor. There were about 14,000 people of us there. And if you tried to leave, you were shot, period, all right? And that was it. That was the start of Yarek. We went to the first concentration camp which was in Croatia. It, the name was Krnja. They wanted to take me away because my sister was too young, but I was uh, eight, eight years old. And they wanted to re-educate us, you know, to make us little communists or whatever, I don't know. But they would catch us during the day, and then at nights they would throw us in this one house. Come, got dark, we would go right through the window and go come back again, you know. And eventually they gave up on it, you know. They, they left us with the parents. But they took my father away. Constant hunger pushed them to desperate measures. In the summer, there was alfalfa patches in the garden, and there were some <clears throat> bugs flowing on top of your soup. Some of us were glad we had little meat. We got barley soup with barely anything in it, and sometimes we got pea soup with uh, maggots in it. One time uh, we caught a cat and killed it and uh, cooked and ate it. In the beginning we used to use anything but came and crawled. We got a, a what we call a linsen soup with some worms crawling on top, a piece of bread twice a day and that was it. When the policemen after lunch they ate watermelon. And sometimes two, three hundred people would wait. They throw down the green stuff from the first floor. The husks from the bean, dry shelled beans, what they used to feed the cows, they give it this, cooked in water. I was a big chubby thing, and this in half a year, I was down to very skinny, you know. 46 was so bad, there was no food. If the water, uh, I go uh, walk in the kitchen and was uh, helping, you know, peeling the, the potatoes. And then I stole, you know, mm -hmm. I put it in my pocket. 
We were sold every single day as laborers. At that time, I was also 14, and we had to go to work on the fields. But that wasn't so bad, because you could always find something to eat. Whatever grew on the fields, without them looking at us, without them seeing it, we always put something in our mouth and turned around and tried eating it, because they always were there with their machine guns, with their guns, and hitting people if they wouldn't walk fast enough, and they just stood there and died. But there wasn't enough food, because all what he got paid for was in food. And so I had to go to some farmers and tended cows for food also. They played soccer afterwards. Shortly after I was told there's a team that always lose. If I do good, I will get a big reward. After the game, the opposite team wanted to know who is that goalie. So my team said he's our prisoner, my teammate forced my mouth open. I remember it's called Hungarian Freilitzer. Uh, they're very hot peppers. Six of them forced me. That was my reward. <laughs> Women would give their jewelry, wedding rings, anything they had in exchange for food. We had to hide. Even our own people would turn us in to get a sandwich. Every day, it's, when it was time for my mother to come, I'd go to the gate, and the first thing out of my mouth was, what do you have to eat? We had hardly any food, and if it wouldn't have been for my mother, and all the other mothers, I think we children would have all died. My grandmother had spotted an outhouse that was attached to the to the back of the, the, the barn in the back. That was the only and, and I was so skinny I fit through the through the seat. <laughs> Here I am and my grandmother says, Well we're gonna lay a couple of boards of this garbage there, you know. And you go through there in and then you bring the potatoes to there, you know, and they were there, oh, there they put a couple of boards again there and then I just rolled them out and they were outside the day. When I heard the, when I heard the a step where somebody stopped outside. I said, oh, they're coming like I would go and I would dive in there and sometimes I miss. <laughs> My grandma said, I clean you, but I, I never got rid of that smell, even when I was cleaned, you know. I had two grandmothers. The two of them had to cook for them all night. They wouldn't touch the two grandmothers. And we weren't there. My mom was hiding too. So they left those two women alone because they cooked for them. And when they had enough, and they, they uh, had enough drinking too, they fell asleep wherever they stood. So next door to us, the lady opened the house for us. She hid us behind a big ovens, how should I say, where they cooked inside in the winter, and put lots and lots of blankets to, on top of us. So we slept all day. The next night, the same circus began. My mother used to open the windows and stick those children outside the window to get something, still like the potatoes or whatever we could, bring it in by the windows, put them in the little belly stove they had there. The soldier used to come in and they sticked underneath looking for the potatoes and things that we hide it in there. And when they caught us, we got beaten up. They were right next to a police station, a storage room. So for two and a half nights, we were able to steal a lot of wheat. When you're desperate, you're gonna die anyhow. They used what they had and found uses for what they could find. What was the most valued possession, clothing, they had? And you would never guess what it is. It's shoes. We got them, they got a pair of shoes that, I don't know where they got all those shoes from. But they were anyway, used, you said. They but they were, were used, yeah. Twine 
and it'll become probably <clears throat> the most important. A comb was the next most important. Comb yourself and that some of the lice from your head would go on a paper, uh, white sheet to kill them. However, the eggs always keep hatching out. A hinge from the door and put a little stick in to use for a hatchet to cut some of the limb. Some of us made our own music with a comb and a paper. We were lucky that we had uh, my aunt and they came also to Kakaba and they had stuff with them like uh, extra blankets and so on and stuff like that, maybe extra clothes. I had things I played with were strings, were uh, buttons on a string. My brother taught me how to make mud bombs. You make a nice, uh, you take mud and you make a nice big round bomb, you stick your thumb in it and you spit in it and then you find a nice little place and slam it down and it would explode. <laughs> We had no shoes. My cousin was really good at knitting booties, so my mother had given me a pair of booties and said, don't lose these, these were our shoes. The best chance you had was if you had a profession. If you were a shoemaker, a tailor, especially a butcher. Because a butcher usually could steal something and the most valuable thing you could buy that time is what you hate the most, fat. You cannot live without fat. If you had a kilo of bacon, boy, you could do all kinds of things with that. You gave your wedding ring, your earrings, that usually money we didn't have. So that was our currency. They took us to City Hall one day, and uh, whatever you had on your body was taken off your body, and it was a big pile of clothing. They took one, one dress or whatever it was, threw it to you, whether it fit or not, that was yours. No hot water, we had to keep clean. They had that pump that you had to pump up and down and then water came out. We washed ourselves there and you know with what? We gathered red stones which were very smooth and that was our soap. And they came at night and checked our feet. If the feet were not clean, they hit you so hard the next day you had to go to work, you couldn't even walk. I was able to, to win a couple of uh, coins filler coins, 20 filler coins, and I would make rings out of them. The Banesh Decree, Article 1. Any act, the object of which is to aid the struggle for liberty of the Czechs and Slovaks is not illegal. Any violent act, including rape and the murdering of children, is sanctioned. The guards watched every move. Their only order, shoot to kill. I was always too scared to go out of the concentration camp because there was guards all around and people got shot regularly. You had to crawl through the guards, most of the time in the nighttime, to get to Tamarin. And there we bet, you know, you were lucky if you got a piece of bread or a piece of you know, a bacon or anything like that, and oh my God, you know. But the, the partisans were relatively smart in one way. Okay, they let the people go out, but they, when they came back, they catch them because that was additional food for their table. And at night, we rest on the field. Where do we go? You see, like, steam coming from the ground. That's where we're going to go. The steam was coming from piles of horse manure and cow manure. And we go in there, we dig a hole, and we cover ourselves all oh, nice and warm. We didn't mind the stink. It stunk, but we covered ourselves, and we warmed up. We already came through a vineyard. And I don't know, one of the kids must have made a noise, and the guard woke up and uh, called Stoy. Well, the boy beside me panicked, got up and ran, and he got shot. Then the next one got up, 
and uh, he, he got it in the arm, so he died a couple of weeks later. And they shine, they can see for miles, and they shine. We see the shine coming, we lay down flat. They spot you, they come on horseback, and they catch you, and they beat you, and they lock you up in the cellar for three or four days, no food, no water, no nothing. People die around you. It was, you know, you were not allowed to put fire on. If they saw you had fire, which they were very particular about it, they came and they uh, punished you. They locked you up for three, four days without drinking and eating. And when you came out, you were too weak, you died. You sometimes were not allowed to cross. You know, they were on one side of the street and I was on this side. So we played together, kids. A guard was on one end. If you crossed, they used to shoot at you. You were allowed to cross from, I think, from 8 to 9 and from 11 to 12, said so traffic. Well, I learned how to keep time by that. One guard shot at me. Then one day they came to the camp. They took us in a wagon, put us in a big hole, and they, they had to strip ourselves. They had grease on. We had to wash ourselves with that stuff. And one woman did a mistake. She got it in her face. She was so burnt. She looked horrible. It was in people who went like to the nearby farms and got caught. They got severely punished. They put people in the basements for days, beat them up, hardly nothing to eat. When they came on day out in daylight again, it looked like they aged 10 years in a week. My father made a Christmas tree for all the people in camp, how he took a piece of uh, wood and they, they got branches from, from shrubs uh, and he stuck it in there and he fashioned the Christmas tree in the Christmas Eve of 1945, uh, 46. Uh, to decorate it they hung dyed wood shavings. All the women and men gathered around this little tree and sang Christmas songs and the guards watched with them and how everybody cried, remembering what it was like. My grandfather came in, he spoke the language very well because we had a business. The Serbian folks, they knew what we had in the house. They also knew that we were business people. And uh, my grandfather had a big winery. So they all came for the wine, and they all came for the whiskey, and they were all drunk. Some of them said, oh, there are two young girls in the house, a young woman. That's enough for all of us. So at that time, my grandfather made the decision. He rescued my mom and hid her. And all of a sudden, there were noises in every house and screams and fires. And people came from, from the Serbian side and they robbed us. And then you heard the women screaming because they were raped. Daytime came, we didn't go in our house. We seemed from, from, you know, from, in, from the back. They were laying, those soldiers were laying all over the place, all over the courtyard, over everything, drunk. The, 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 the Serbs sang, uh, sang uh, uh, songs. The people that were brought to the place that my grandfather helped to dig a big, big hole, they were stood there and shot into that hole. My grandfather came home one day to us, at that time we were still in our homes, and he said, children, I want to tell you something. This is going to be true what we heard. We dug out a grave where the whole town fits in. The first night in our town, if I think correctly, 79 people took their own lives. There was one family a couple of houses from us. Two young girls, they were not as, we were kids yet, but they were maybe 20, 22 years old. The grandparents and the parents, they all hung themselves because they had to witness the girls being raped. So the Russians would always respect the churches. And there's some famous stories that a Russian officer in the First World War came to the church and wrote in Russian letters on it, please do not enter this building. It is a house of God. The Germans had killed over 20 million Russians. This was a completely different war than the First World War. This was a, a genocidal war. When the Russian soldiers entered, they wanted to prevent.
Their suffering was far beyond what a person could take. Sorrow followed them, always waiting for its chance. So my mother went to our well, took a cup that was always standing there, and then brought the water. After he drank and gave it back, we went inside, and my mother went to the well to put back the cup. She took a drink from the cup, and then she gave some to me, because I most likely asked for it. And, uh, but a few weeks later, we came down with typhoid fever. My brother was, was uh, contracting typhus, and uh, when you have typhus, one of the signs is that, that your mind goes. So now, they, in order to keep the, the typhus people separated from the, the others so they don't all get sick, they have set up a house. Mostly, uh, the, the lack of salt is part of that illness. So, they asked, my grandmother asked me to, to beg for salt. So, we went for about seven hours walking to a town, go for about two hours begging, I had a little pouch on my neck, and ever so often I got a spoonful. In concentration camp, we were totally deprived of salt. Your body needs salt. People got blind. They tried to make you sick any which way they could. So the first thing, sickness what came was typhoid. And then diphtheria. And what was it? There? Oh, yeah, dysentery, you know, what we call in plain words, the runs. There we had, I had such bad uh, eye infection, boils that would appear and pop open and heal and reappear, and that was all because of the malnutrition. Every body had boils coming out, you know, pus, big, like, like an inch, two inches across. I still had scars on my foot. I, I only had a few, but some people, some, some kids suffered terribly. This is from the malnutrition. There was one little kid there at the infirmary. He had scurvy so bad that his, uh, that it rotted through, through his cheek. He had a hole there. And when they gave him milk to drink, they held his mouth shut. The milk in Sickness was prevalent, but the survivors have many other stories to tell. They took all the orphans, which I was an orphan, of course, but I did have somebody taking care of me. They took the uh, orphans and took them to the southern part of Yugoslavia into a communist orphanage. They raised those kids as Serbians. There was a uh, girl that came into our home. We, we became friends because I was the only guy actually that would talk to her. She uh, asked me if I can help to clean her lice. There was a big scab on there, so I lifted the scab up there, and there was paws underneath, and the lice um, crawling in the, in, in, in the paws there. And I was so scared, I returned the paws, I put it back on top of the head, and even today, I am still, it still affects me emotionally. We walked and walked for about half an hour, an hour, till we found a farmer. And my mother knocked on the door and she says, if we can stay in the uh, store where the cows there is, that we have a little. She says, I have my children, if we can stay here. So they says, oh, he says, the, the Austria used to call us the Sksindl. Yeah, the Sksindl, that means you know, bad people like, I don't know how should I say it in English. Do you know how to say it? Scum of the earth. Yeah, right. scum of the earth, or whatever they called us. And the first day was Christmas Eve, which my mother used to uh, feed the cow, milk the cow, and all that. That was our first meal, which we had in about three, three or four months. And there, we had to be in a big hall, I and mean, we were sent to this big hall. I don't know if those were dance halls or what at the time, you know, but huge rooms. And people laid down straw, sat down straw. And they had big lists on the walls, 
where the natives could come and see if any of their relatives made it to the West. They put us in the beautiful city of Dresden. 600,000 people lived there and 600,000 refugees were there. This all changed by uh, February 13, 1945. Without any warning, about 1 o'clock in the morning, a lot of airplanes, hundreds of them came back, not to bomb, but to throw chemicals down. Now that chemical, when it came down, it didn't matter if it was uh, iron, if it was concrete, if it was, in fact, the streets melted, it was so hot. I mean, everything was in flame. It was hell on earth. And people were outside because there was no warning. So even the people started running around and burned. The zoo, the elephants, tigers, lions came out on fire. It was chaos. Lucky for us, we were close to a park, and through the park we were able to get to the Elbe River. Even though it was frozen, there was enough water on the side where we could throw it in our faces because that fire created like a lot of heat. I mean, unbearable heat. And then it also created like a wind. It's almost like tornado light. And last of all, it sucked out the oxygen. We suffocated. So that water really helped us. Some of the harsh memories were too hard to hide. Fleet of trucks from America. And this was a gift from the American government. The next day, all the tires were missing. People used it for their shoes, for soles. They found out my father was a cabinet maker and all of a sudden he found himself working for the bosses to build houses for the better workers, the civilians. So they would be making windows and doors and they'd hang them and then overnight some, they would come and he'd steal it. And he said, if you, if you didn't know what chup chup meant, which means steal, you couldn't live. We had a big snowstorm. We had to shovel out a locomotive. I thought this was the end of my life. I had no energy left. My body was weak and my spirit very low. A woman and a man were taken and the grandmother had their 18-month-old son. And as they were being put on the train, the grandmother quick shoved the baby into the car with them and he ended up being in their camp this child. And when my father told me this, this broke my heart. Um, the baby grew up. He started to talk. And he was like a toddler. Walk. And everybody was around this child in, in Russia. And one time, the person who was, the woman who brought their food, which was a wagon where the sour borscht was on, a big tub, she brought her children along. There were two little kids. And the baby never saw children. And my father said he walked up to the children and touched them and didn't know what they were, that they were little like him. And all the men and women surrounded this child, these children, and they all had the same thought. They thought of their own children and how they were worried about what was going on with their children. There were also toys thrown and they had explosives in them. My mom always said, please don't ever pick anything up. When you have seen a mother kissing her children for the last time and then throwing her into the icy water of a bridge and then jumping behind them, killing all her family and herself, then you know what it means to be. The only thing I remember that was sad for me, like Autumn says, when the wagons came by and got the, the dead people, I remember a little girl, they had put in a box, and it was springtime with all the blossoms. It was so pretty. And then 
all the people would go and hold their hands like this when they prayed. Well, every time I seen my mother do this, I made her hands go away because I thought she's going to die. You know, being little, I didn't realize until she found out why I was doing that. And she said, no, I'm not going to die. I'm just praying, you know. And my mother, I think, because she was, would, was, would, would be cooking for the little, for the young kids since my sister was very young, you know. And there were 200 kids under two years old. And from the 200 kids, three survived. And one of them was my sister, which I owe that, I made an impression on me, you know. To recognize when somebody was di uh, died beside you. Interesting, I learned to see it, we were completely infested by lice, you know, you couldn't keep yourself clean. When the lice, you could see the lice leaving and that body was like a streak going along, coming towards you. That sure meant the other guy was dead because they didn't have any blood to get out of it anymore. When they caught us, we got beaten up about it, the children and things. And then little children died. They take those little children who passed away. They throw them in a, a little shed. The first, the kids died. The smaller kids died. And up to maybe seven or eight years old, between eight and 10 or 12 were the best survivors. The age of a baby to three, four, five years old, there were about 1,400 of them in there. And they were the first ones to go. And then the old people. My grandmother, both of them were there. And when the old people gave up the hope and naturally with uh, nutrition, what we had, they started to die in droves. Uh, when they die, they put them in a, in, a, in a room, you know. But when they had eight persons together, they put them on a wagon, one this way, one this way. And, and eight men uh, carried them out. They grabbed them by the head and by the feet them right on the wagon. And I followed that wagon along. Bodies were thrown into mass graves, then they poured over a layer of white lime. The more people died, the higher we stacked them, because we couldn't keep up. They threw it in there, and that was kept open until they had enough. Covered it up with about a foot of the topsoil, if they had it. And when they Spring and summer came along, you could smell it from a mile. It's still in my nose. I can smell dead meat, I think, better than anything else. And my grandfather, he was in the 80s. After we got there, it didn't take too long, my grandfather died. My grandmother died of syphilis. When my first grandmother died, she was right in the spring of 1945. Uh, in February, my grandfather died. And next spring, my mother died. In November, my 16-year-old sister died. Then my second grandmother followed about, oh, it was two months later on. There were sometimes a hundred people that died a day. My sister the same way. She died a little bit later. And my 10-year-old sister held her in her arms when she died grandparents would give their food to the children, so then the grandparents would die, and then all these children were all over the town. And then uh, I was all by myself over there, 10 years old. There were five boys. <laughs> they were between three and eight years old, or nine. And when we played at home, everybody wanted to be their friend because the boys always st stuck, stuck together, the brothers. You didn't want to get beaten up at that five. And one by one.
from the youngest to the oldest, they died. A few weeks apart. <laughs> Nobody made a, boy, a box for the oldest. When it felt like all was lost, a kind gesture would bring a moment of pleasure to the prisoners who were losing faith in humanity. In 1948, we were more or less scattered out. I believe once a year we even got rubber boots. When the representatives came from the United Nations, the communists in Czechoslovakia went to extremes to hide the horror being inflicted on the ethnic German children. Live this Serbian woman. Now, I roam the streets, I could do whatever I want, but across the street was something very beautiful. A huge pear tree. There was a garden, and there was pears all over it. I remember standing at the gate and trying to think how I was going to open the gate, run to the tree, grab a pair, and run back without being noticed. And I'm thinking so hard on this, all of a sudden, this woman comes out of the house and she's repeating after me. She keeps on saying this over and over these words, and I wasn't afraid of her. She opened the gate, she took me by her hands, she walked me over to the pear tree, gave me a pear. So that's something else to me. Motioned me to come with her. St I stood in front of the door. She went in, she came out with a big piece of bread. And she gave me that piece of bread and the pear and set me off. In April, the church bells did ring for a long time. No one did know why. But then the rumor spread that the war has ended. Through the night, sometimes we have to work on the bridge on outside. I remember it was midnight, the sky was so clear, the stars and the moon were shining, and it was so bitter cold, and we were all in a circle, and we were singing what we can. Fancy men dressed with suits and ties, coming and looking us over, they put us all, line us up over there, somebody said, these are people from the U U.S. They're going to help you. There was thousands of kids over there. I don't know what happened to the others. I was among a group of a few hundred. They put us again in, you know, freight train. And they bring us to Gross Patch Creek. They put us in a spanking new hospital there, everything bright. The first time we seen a, a flushing toilet, flush toilet, clean beds, sheets on it, pillows, food. Doctors come, check you out, this and that. We stay there for about two months. They put us to school. They start off in, in second or third grade, you know, with the little kids, because we couldn't speak the language. So they put us with these kids, and in no time at all, within months, we could speak the language. There were some nice times when we all, the kids all went and played in the, in the big um, square in the town. I really liked that. We did all these little games. As you, when you were young, you don't think of all the bad things. You don't even realize what has happened around you. You know, you just go what, and do what, at the moment, what is fun. We were in, again in a vineyard and a guy comes along with him. Uh, a bicycle, very dressed, black, a uniform, hat, and he says, ah! And it turned out he was a, an Austrian mailman. 
And he says his obligation was to report us, so the Russians shipped us back to Yugoslavia. And then he looked at me and he said, no, nah, not going to do it. Took in his house and he didn't have much. Gave us to eat. And then he gave us some money. And he had a friend in the next little village who had a little truck and he was supplying uh, vegetable and all kinds of stuff into the what we call the English zone. Austria was divided in four zones for the Allies. He said, well, go to him, he'll take care of you. Hmm. So whatever happened to me, usually you think, you know, there were always bad, bad people. Well, I learned there are other people around too. that my father was still alive and he was living in uh, Munich, Germany where we eventually got there too and I lived and bombed out Munich for uh, two and a half years until my dad and mom uh, we decided to come to America. We came to this station, this is Union Station. This is where most of us at the early times we come on boat across to New York and then we come by train to Chicago and we landed in Union Station. My father found out where we were, he was in Hungary, and he also paid those guys to pick us up. And we did the same bridge as Autumn says, that little bridge, I still see it now. It was dark and you had to go across, it wasn't many wider than this, big ditch and you go over it, you know. One time I remember I had my apron full of berries because that's what the people gave us, you know, so. <laughs> and then we went to Austria. Uh, we were able to go across the border at night time. When I hear my husband is still alive, that was the first thing when I came out the train. While, I, while we were in Germany, uh, we found my cousin, the family that took care of me, whose son was in Germany, he was returned to Germany. And in one of the camps that uh, you had to go to register, we found him. So that was another miracle. So again, when you go back, and some of those things flash back. When you come right down to it, I don't know how we survived. I really don't know. Sometimes you get nightmares yet still from what happened, you know. And I just hope my children don't have to go what we went through. This story is not over. The pain still exists. Even today, the ethnic Germans are still fighting for their rights. When the Russians uh, overwhelmed the, the German uh, army in 1944, they have taken over and that was the regime that was going on until the 1980s uh, when the Berlin Wall fell. Now you might say, this was fair, I mean, how can a child be punished for something, but I think that's the craziness of nationalism. You don't see the person anymore, you see the nationality. Tito turned out to be a maverick communist. He was not exactly a, a favorite the brother of the Communist Party, uh, because he was um, marching to the sound of his own drummer, not that of, of Stalin. They were released into East Germany not into Yugoslavia, because had they been released into Yugoslavia, they would have found absolutely nothing of what they have left behind, because they were totally disenfranchised, dispossessed, and there was nothing to come home to. Now, the people who told me stories, they were from Pomerania, uh, some from Romania, and some, of course, from what today is the Czech Republic. And so. I mean, this was a fate that happens all over Eastern Europe. And I even met some who lived inside Russia, so-called Volga Germans, who never, I mean, 
even were under Hitler's rule, they always remained under Soviet Union rule and they were deported to Siberia and to camps only because they were German. One of my friends, very good friends, he works right now in the Ukraine in a village where they try to resettle uh, Russian Germans and to prevent them to go to Germany, which is a little bit odd. But you have to keep in mind, the refugees are not welcome in Germany. None of these, none of my ancestors were welcome. Most German families have some stars like that. Some of them. 